Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Robinhood stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Robinhood is an online stockbroker. It is known for pioneering commission-free trades of stocks and ETFs. The company's revenue comes from three main sources, interest earned on customers' cash balances, selling order information to high frequency trading firms, and margin lending. It has 31 million users. 81% of its revenue comes from payment for order flow, which is when a broker gets compensated for routing stocks or options trades to certain firms and pocketing part of the bid ask spread. Payment for order flow is a practice pioneered by Bernie Madoff. There is a chance the SEC will ban it or change it in some way. The company is headquartered in Menlo Park, California and was founded in 2013. It started trading this year and can be found on the NASDAQ. During the 2020 market crash, Robinhood saw more trading activity on its app. The average age of its customer is 26. It does not offer retirement accounts, mutual funds, or bonds. In late June 2021, it was fined $57 million by FINRA and has been ordered to pay $13 million in restitution to clients affected by outages and misleading communications in March 2020. This was the largest ever FINRA penalty in the history of the organization. In August 2017, the company began offering free stocks in exchange for referring new users. It has prohibited its users from purchasing some high-risk penny stocks, such as banning purchases of Helios and Matheson Analytics, the owner of MoviePass. It typically only supports trading stocks and ETFs listed on the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, and normally does not support securities traded at OTC. In August 2018, it added some American depository receipts by allowing customers to buy 250 highly searched international stocks. It also offers commission-free trading for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Dogecoin, Ethereum Classic, and Litecoin. The company faced controversy in June 2020 after University of Nebraska student Alexander E. Kearns committed suicide after seeing a negative cash balance of $730,000 in his Robinhood margin trading account. This was a temporary negative balance due to unsettled trading activity. On January 28, 2021, Robinhood and other retail brokers restricted the trading of certain stocks following an effort by users of Wall Street bets to drive up the stock price. Robinhood restricted trading in these stocks in order to meet collateral requirements at their clearinghouse. This upset many investors and politicians. The app suffered an influx of one-star reviews on Google Play App Store. Protesters showed up outside Robinhood headquarters, the SEC, and the New York Stock Exchange. On January 28th, a class action lawsuit against Robinhood for alleged market manipulation was filed. The lawsuit alleges that the app knowingly removed GME from its trading platform in the midst of an unprecedented stock rise, depriving retail investors of the ability to invest in it. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 46 billion market cap. They're trading at $55 a share and they have 836 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did have a lot of free cash flow in 2019 and 20, but a big negative in the trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was negative most years except in 2020, a small positive. Revenue is the sales for the company, and that goes up a lot from $300 million to $1.4 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. So their cost of revenue is pretty low because it's just mainly staffing to maintain the website and for customer support. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that grew a lot from $230 million to $1.2 billion. Below that is operating expenses. Their big operating expenses are payroll and research and development. They paid only 6.2 million of interest on their debt, but they did add a lot of debt in the first quarter. So their interest expense should be a lot higher in future income statements. And they had this big negative 1.6 billion in other income and expenses. 
Since the company just recently IPO'd, we don't have access to their first quarter financials. The big negative in other income and expenses is mainly attributed to the loss of $3.5 billion in debt that it raised in February. Without seeing the actual 10Q, it's really hard to understand what this loss is really attributed to. So even though they have negative net income, I would just focus on operating income because that's a better indicator of how the company's doing. And they're growing their operating income. It was negative 100 million, now it's 272 million. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses or generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So they did have a big negative in operating cash flow in the trailing 12 months. In the first quarter of 2021, they posted $5 billion of accounts receivables. That means they provided a service but didn't receive the funds, so it's a cash negative. When they do receive the funds, then it'll be a cash inflow. They don't have too much in CapEx. They raised $700 million from selling stock in 2019 and $1.3 billion in 2020. They also raised $2 billion recently from their IPO. That's not on these financials because these numbers are as of 331. And they issued a lot of debt in the trailing 12 months. Four and a half billion, they paid down 1.2 billion. So they do have positive free cash flow in 2019 and 20, but it is negative in the trailing 12 months. This article from CNN last week mentions the company raised $2.1 billion from its IPO. So that's two billion extra of cash that's not on these financials. So the company has negative 1.5 billion of equity. They've lost 1.6 billion from running their business so far. A majority of that loss is made up from this first quarter. So I think that's a one-time item. It shouldn't recur in the future. So I do expect their future financials to be a lot stronger. Their 2020 numbers were fine. It was just first quarter. It was a little weird. Let's look at the capital structure. Their liabilities are greater than their assets. So they have negative 1.5 billion of equity and 4.7 billion of debt. But their net debt is negative. So they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet if they wanted to and still have 1.3 billion of cash left over. Their weighted average cost of capital is on the higher side. It's 12.57%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for. That's $26 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $22 billion. We divide that by 836 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $27. They're trading at $55, so they're trading at a 106% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Just because my model says it's a sell doesn't mean the stock price won't go up. I think there's a really good chance this stock price will go way higher. I think this may be the mother of all meme stocks. I wouldn't be surprised if this market cap hit $500 billion. The way I calculated their future free cash flows, I just took the median of these three numbers which was 1.2 billion. And I grew that 20% for four years, then 2.5% after that. So it's really hard to value this company because you don't know what direction they're going. I could see them easily beating my estimates or I could see them struggling for a really long time to become profitable. Two analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $55. Since the stock IPO, it's gone up 58%. The low was 33, the high was 85. 84 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 835 million shares outstanding, 105 million are on float and 37% are held by institutions. Analysts are projecting their earnings to grow 63% and their revenue to grow 21%. If you invested $10,000 when this company IPO'd, you'd be at $16,000 today. The biggest shareholder is New Enterprise at 17%, then Index Ventures. The co-founder 8%, the other co-founder 6.3%, and also DST Global. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE because they have negative net income. We can't look at the price to book because they have negative equity. And their price to sales is pretty high at 34, so investors are paying $34 for $1 revenue. The average in the market is 9.5 and the median is 2.9. When a company has a high price to sales ratio and people buy the stock, they're expecting the company's revenue to grow a lot. When you invest in a company with a low price to sales ratio, you wouldn't expect their revenue to grow as much. They have a good current ratio, 1.6. Same thing for the quick ratio. 
And they have a lot of cash on that balance sheet, $6 billion. And that does not include the $2 billion from their IPO. They have $5.5 billion of receivables. It's surprising that a company like this would have so much receivables. Because they're not selling any physical products. They're just selling a service. This might be owed to them from the market makers for the payment for order flow. For their cut of the fees. They also have $3.4 billion of restricted cash. Restricted cash is cash that's set aside for a specific purpose. If we had access to their first quarter financials, we might be able to figure out what this cash is supposed to be used for, but we don't. They do seem to be well capitalized. They have $5.7 billion of working capital. Plus, they should have positive free cash flow going forward. The type of loss that occurred for the first quarter probably won't happen again. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 19 companies in the same industry as HUD. And HUD doesn't have such good ratios. They are a young company. They do have a pretty big market cap for being such a young company, 46 billion. But I think it's going to take time for their ratios to improve. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 106% premium. But it's really scary when you invest in a stock like this and 80% of its revenue comes from something that may be banned by the SEC soon. I'm not saying it will be banned. It's not looked upon so highly by a lot of parties because it does not align the broker with their customer. But this company has so many members, it might be able to monetize those members in other ways. Maybe even selling ad space on their website or selling other services. I'm confident they're gonna come up with a lot more things. I rank their free cash flow as 1 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratio is 1 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.